Um, we have, as usual, a raffle. Please don't forget to put your cards into the bowl to be eligible for the raffle. We have two prizes today. Uh, we have a Volaris A320 Neo aeroplane uh, donated by Airbus. Uh, and the other prize, I think, is quite unique. I've never, ever heard of this before. Uh, Enrique has volunteered, uh, together with our friends at Volaris, that the winner of the second raffle prize will have an airplane named after them. This, not just an airplane model, but a real-life Airbus aeroplane will have your name painted on the nose of the aeroplane. Now, have you ever heard of that before? This is quite unique. And we really appreciate, Enrique, to you and the Valaris team for coming up with this stunning raffle prize. We'll be back with you after lunch to do our speaker introduction and Enrique's talk. Cost is a derivation of complicated processes, okay? And I strongly think that we all need to work trying to simplify the earth. I also think that low fares excel market and market growth. I think elasticity in middle class populated countries is absolutely an achievable target. And that's why I strongly think that ultra low cost carriers have a great future for Latin America. And I also understand that Latin America still, still doesn't appreciate the ultra low cost carrier models and its implications to the industry yet. The fall of oil international prices with more than 55% is, is really uh, creating a dip. Exports, um, as a result of this, will buy, will, uh, will buy less imports, and that means we'll be a poorer country this year in relationship to the rest of the world, and that's not good because that has not been the trend in the previous years. This shock is probably not going to be relevant in one part which I think is really important, and it's the trade balance, okay? It will certainly be relevant with its hit to the fiscal income at the Federation, with some caveats, okay? Is that Mexico, um, in, in, uh, uh, in this year, still had hedges for the revenues that they had planned from, from oil. So the Federation probably is not going to suffer this same year, or it's going to suffer less than it should suffer, okay? And the state and the municipal level, the stabilization funds will support their economies. But nevertheless, we'll see fiscal cuts that will certainly happen, and Mexico will try to revert the situation. And something which is really important, and this is a trend every time what this has happened in the last 50 years, Mexico has done a better fiscal spending budget and less expense any time the price of oil dropped. So this is something that is really important. We're used to it, and we're used to manage this kind of crisis, OK? Then on the other side, the monetary policy is going to play an important role, OK? And I think the most important role for the central bank this year is to control inflation. And I strongly think that the big difference between this crisis and the crisis in the, in the 80s and in the 90s in Mexico is that now we have an independent central bank. And let me tell you, I think we probably have one of the best central bank chairmen that we ever have, and probably one of the best in the world, okay? From the government perspective, we need to be given credit, a big credit, I would say, to the actual government on the political field and the achievements when they approved last year 11 major reforms that they passed. Two of them, I think, are going to be tremendously positive, the telecommunications and the energy reform. They both may guarantee economic growth in the midterm, and they are really important. This year, we're expecting a healthy US economy, and that always helps Mexico. We expect the GDP to grow somewhere between 2.5% and 3.1%. And that is partially going to be driven by the growth of the US. Uh, it will be certainly impacted by the oil price reductions. But something which is really important is that we will see the, the, the inflation pretty much controlled at the level of 3.5%, an exchange rate that may fluctuate between 13.5% and 15.5%. And, uh, and, uh, but then, look at this graph. I think the big surprise for Mexico is the manufacturing sector. 
We expect a boom on manufacturing tours, on manufacturing, on tourism, remittances, maquila or drawback manufacturing, particularly in the automotive industry that has driven the industrial activity since 2009 crisis and will be in great shape in, for 2015. The strong manufacturing performance has also generated a recuperation of our consumer con confidence. So, where are we in Volaris today in, in the middle of this uh, panorama that I just explained? Volaris was a company that was founded in 2006. We entered the US market, as Barry said, in 2009. Uh, um, and uh, we went public in 2013, almost two years ago. We we're both registered in New York Stock Exchange and Mexican Stock Exchange, and uh, it's a fully registered deal in, in, the, in, in the US. Our main customer segments are visiting friends and relatives, and we are a very, very price-sensitive leisure customers. We operate point to point, and uh, Someone in the U.S. that hears that we're an airline that operates point-to-point. -point. I mean, in the U.S., you had Southwest operating point-to-point -point since the 50, 56, something like that. We are really the first point-to-point -point operator, okay? And that's really different, okay? Um, we're one of the youngest fleets in Americas. We have nine years after our foundation, and we now have a very solid market share, okay? So... Let me tell you where we are and, and how is Volaris looking right now. We have a market presence in 2014, and uh, we already have 133 routes. We have um, 50, 57 cities served, 38 domestic, 19 international, 51 aircraft, and we have an order of 60 aircrafts still to come, okay? What we did is we constructed a very solid it's very solid footprint in the domestic market. And uh, in December, the company was already at 25% of market share. So we are already a fourth of the market, of the domestic market. And we have between the US and Mexico already 9.1% market share. Um, the growth is poised to continue as we incorporate our, our orders into the fleet. And uh, speaking about growth, I think it's important to show you what we have done, okay? We start in March of 2009, and the company grows up to 9.8 million passengers already last year, okay? That's that, that's an 18.7 CAGR in the last five years. So think about this, I mean, we're growing somewhere around 18 to 19% every year, building up and building up, okay? We already have $1.1 billion of revenues, and that's a growth in revenues of 7.7% CAGR in the last five years, um, with a cost of 4.9 US cents, and this is a, a, an ex fuel cost, okay? And we are the lowest operator, cost operator in the Americas, okay? Something really important for us, and it's going down also 0.4% in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the last five years, okay? Where do we grow? I mean, where do these passengers come from? I mean, I said it's, it's a point-to-point -point operation, but it's very important to say that it's an operation that it's mainly VFR. I mean, people, when we speak about the low-cost carrier, they think we are a leisure company, and that's a big difference versus the rest of the models in the world. We are a visiting friends and relative um, very much focused airline, okay? So, where, what is important here is what we produced in terms of EBITDA, and this is our five-year EBITDA growth, 23%. We just, we just reported the last quarter of last year with a 31% EBITDA margin um, this morning, okay? So, that's pretty much where we are. When we came to Mexico, you need to understand that Mexico had been uh, through a process which was very different of a lot of countries in the rest of the Americas. We had Mexicana or Mexico that had been managed by the government for almost 20 years, okay? And, um, and the industry was doing pretty, pretty bad, 
okay? Let me give you two numbers which I really remember, and Charlie, you probably remember these two numbers very well. The price was going up from, 2000, from 1995 to 2005 at a level of 5% every year, okay? And then the volume was contracting 5% every year, which was really, really uh, interesting. When you compare Mexico in terms of economy with the rest of the world, and Mexico in, in, in terms of its economy against Latin America, our GDP is probably the average of all the, all the countries, okay? But when you check how many passengers per capita we transport in Mexico, we transport less passengers than Panama, less passengers than Costa Rica, less passengers than Peru, Colombia, Brazil, Chile, etc. So why is it that? And the reason is the buses. We have a 2.8 billion passenger market in buses. 2.8 billion, okay? If I compare that versus the aviation market, which is a 0 0.06 billion, okay, um, we are really tiny, okay? And by the way, that 0 0.06 was point, um, point 0.40 uh, t nine years ago. So. I think it's, it's, it's important to say that when we created the airline, we were really striving to generate new passengers, and it was very important for us. We also came in 2005 to start building the model, started operating in 2006, and from 2005 through 2010, 11 brands, 11 airlines disappeared in the market. Sometimes the, the bankers tell me, I mean, Enrique, when is consolidation going to happen in Mexico? Well, we already had our consolidation. It's 10 or 11 airlines that disappeared. It's a different kind of consolidation, but still a consolidation, okay? Why is this market important to us, okay? Because they, Mexico is a very big country, okay? It's a country where transporting yourself from, from Tijuana to Cancun may take you in an aircraft 5.15 hours, okay? which is pretty much the distance between San Francisco and New York, or New York and London, okay? So it's a big distance, and it's, it's something which is really a challenge. Then on top of that, the topography in the northern part of the country is, is like the Grand Canyon. I mean, it's, there's a lot of desert um, and mountains and cliffs, etc. So people spend, the people that we transport, spend on an average 17.7 .7 hours in a bus, okay? Let me give you two stats which are going to be very interesting for you. I mean, we went back and we started uh, selling our product. We compete in prices in versus segments about five hours. And let me give you two numbers which are going to be really interesting. Five to 6% of our passengers tell us that it's their first time they fly. And when we serve you on board, between 22%, depending on the city and the seasonality, between 22% and 34% of our passengers claim that they first quote the buses and then they quote the aircraft, okay? So it's really a change. And you need to think about this change not only in the perspective of what the model is doing and what the low-cost carrier model is doing into the market, but you need to think also that this is supporting a tremendous development of the economy of the country, okay? So the commercial, uh, the commercial impact that, it, that the model is, is having is pretty interesting. When we went to Mexico, as you see with, with this boss market, and as you see with what I'm telling you that the market was not growing, okay, you can really think again and go back like 20, 25 years in the US and you, you should think that when we started, for us, flying was an elitist, was, was something that only the rich people could do. And with a country that has 113 million inhabitants, I mean, we cannot, see, we cannot say that flying has to be elitist. I mean, flying has to convert itself into a commodity in a country like this. And our challenge in Volaris is to really convert this country into a commodity when it means flying, okay? So extremely high fares, perceived as a luxury, okay? And we, on the other side, we wanted to be able, that everybody would be able to fly. We wanted an airline 
that was tailored to the market. And here I will repeat some words from Bill Frankie from a month ago. We wanted an airline that was tailored to the market, but not tailored to our own ambition, okay? And sometimes, let me tell you, very frequently, I have to tell even the members of the board that this is not the airline for them to fly. <laughs> our brand is also different from the beginning. We created a very disruptive brand. We learned from, 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 from a lot of things that Spirit did in the development, and the Indigo people taught us a lot of things that Spirit. There's one thing that we are not doing that Spirit did, is we are really trying to communicate better with our customers, and we strongly think that it's very difficult to develop a market with people that have never flown, and then treat them bad, and then ask them to fly again. The big challenge in Latin America is to develop an ultra-low-cost carrier model, but on top of that, treat the people very well so we create repetition, so we, we remain and the customers remain with us. And I'm going to tell you a lot of examples later on. Clear messages. I think that's one of our major challenges, okay? And I really fight with Holger together um, with our marketing people that we need to provide clear messages and it's low first and optional services, okay? The creation of ancillary revenues, it's something we absolutely like and we love it, okay? But it's not a creation of ancillary revenues the way you guys did it in the States. We are convincing the people that ancillary revenues are optionalities that they can get if they need them at the moment they need it and we give them total flexibility for them to get them. Still, it's going very well. Our commercial model is perfectly adapted, making buying a ticket irresistible. And here I want to say another thing. When we arrived to Mexico, we had 4,600 IATA agencies. Do you know how many agencies they have now in IATA? Less than 1,000. Why? Because of our penetration to internet. Everything is done through the web, and more than 44% of our sales are generated through Twitter or Facebook. So that's a very important change in the market. Let me show you this. Um, I, when I speak about the circle, I say this is our recipe of product strategy. Our commercial approach is, is in reality a virtue cycle that starts with the low cost, okay, and, and having the lowest cost. Enables lower base fares, okay, this base first creates high stimulation. The high stimulation provides us more volume of passengers that acquire our ancillary revenues, and this requires more capacity in the market. We are explaining every step of this, of this circle to our customers in a very friendly and very simple way. We are the lowest cost operator in America, and that's what I said, okay? Here you have our, our even including fuel or without fuel, without fuel, I said it's 5.4. December closed at 4.6 cents without fuel, okay? Um, why um, it's, it's this important for us? Because the entire model starts from here, okay? We're even lower than COPA, even lower than the U.S. best in class ultra low cost carriers. And we are obviously ahead of the legacy carriers in the Americas. How we do it, and this is something very important. And Fernando, when I was going to present here, told me, Enrique, be sure to tell them that it's not only about managing cost creep, because that's probably what we all do in the industry, okay? It's about having a great and probably the best in the world management team to focus on cost, okay? And our suppliers sitting in this room, they know that when they are dealing with Volaris, we, they can feel miserable because we push and push for costs. Not Barry? <laughs> <laughs> the second thing, which I think it's really important within this, is the aircraft design. And we think, when we think about aircraft, we think about the piece of realty. It's something really different, okay? You all think about an aircraft, 
in terms of number of passengers, in terms of available seat miles, in terms of low factor, we think about the piece of realty. A piece of realty that has two things that are very important. The first one is how do you design it? And we clearly design for high density and we never overspec the aircraft. So when Airbus calls us and tells us that they have this beautiful mood lighting thing, we don't buy it. <laughs> the second thing we do, the second thing we do, which is really important, is once we have a piece of realty, we want to get the best utilization of it. And utilization in an aircraft is measured A, to the number of hours we fly. Last year we flew in average 12 hours per day, but in December we got to 15 hours per day. We were probably one of the highest utilization aircraft uh, customers from Airbus, okay? And that's why I like Airbus, okay? I mean, uh, Barry, you should really feel proud, and you know I was your first customer in the Americas, okay? But then on the other side, one of the beauties of, of Airbus with a combination of Pratt, Ellen, is I consider that a donkey, okay? And it's a donkey from which I take out 15 hours a day, and it has to be absolutely reliable. Aircraft reliability for Volaris is 99.6%. And that tells you how big that is. And maintenance reliability is at the level of 99.6%. We really, also, it's not just about utilization. Again, I go back to the concept of the piece of realty. The aircraft for us has to have a high density, and we try to put as many seats as we can. Okay? Modern freight. It's very important because what we're seeing, and especially in the changing years of a model like Airbus going to NEOS or Boeing going to MAX, etc. The efficiencies of the fleet are very important. And it's not only about fuel efficiencies, but it's also about the rest of the aircraft and its efficiencies. And there we do invest, okay? I mean, when it comes to equipment, when it comes to safety, when it comes to really efficiency, we do in, in, invert, invest. On-time performance of the airline is about 86%, and as I said, maintenance reliability 99.6. How do we manage to give you get out of time prices? And that's something really important. So the first thing is we depart from a real clean base fare. And when I mean a real clean base fare, it has to be absolutely clean. We speak in the company about static, okay? And what the other things create to the, to the base fare, they only create static. And, and it really, I mean, if you focus on that, you really get to, to reduce the prices, okay? Obviously, reducing the prices is something very easy, okay? If you do not consider your cost structure, okay? Again, the cost structure is really important. But then you also need to, to think about how you can recover from the, from the reduction of prices and, and from the production of getting out of town prices. We depart from a real clean base fare, as I said, and then we let the customers choose for optional. And, and, and this is something that has been really important. I mean, in the last nine years, we never had the authority of customer protection in Mexico complain about our model. Why? Because we're always speaking about low fares, and then we speak about optionalities, and we don't speak about ancillary revenues. We speak about letting the people to have the choice to select what they are purchasing and how they are purchasing, when they are purchasing, and in which system they are purchasing, which is really important. So the results in Get Out of Town passengers have been amazing. Customer messages and marketing is set up to perfectly communicate the commercial model. Speaking about letting the customers choose for optionals, let me show you our ancillary revenue strategy results. And this is it. I mean, we grow 53% per year in the last five years, okay? So giving the optionality to the client is not bad, okay? I mean, forcing the ancillaries is bad, but giving the customers the optionality to get there gives you a 53% per year growth, okay? And that has already taken us to 206 million US dollars, $22 per passenger, but still a 
clearly large way to go to get to spirit levels, which is already at 55, or a legion, which is at 40-something. The upside here is really important. And let me tell you what else is going on. When we were challenged a year ago by different airlines in terms of pricing and the, and the penetration that we were having, what we did is the airlines reduced their pricing levels basically at our level, but then when we went back and the economy started to recuperate and the capacity was much more aligned in the market, we ended up with 22% of ancillary revenues which our competitors lost. So in reality, they ended up with a net, net margin loss, which at least accounts for 22% in the pricing structure of the country. Where do we see the challenges in the following years? I think the first one, and it's not written here, I'm sorry, is in distribution, in digital marketing. I think we all need to start thinking in digital marketing as the way to go for the future, okay? I told you, I mean, a lot of sales are coming from Twitter, from Facebook, social media. What we're doing in terms of covering ourselves in the different uh, engines that are selling tickets. But I think one of the most important pieces that we need to take in consideration in our strategy is digital marketing. We clearly, we want to continue ahead providing the market capacity with rationality, okay? And that, I, I strongly think this is very important. It's not just about growing, okay? And this goes to the bankers, okay? Bankers, a year ago, or two years ago, when you asked me, I mean, what is going to be your capacity growth for the next five years? I understand you guys. I mean, you, you are bringing me people to invest. But just growing capacity without thinking what capacity does to the market is a mistake. We strongly think that we have to be disciplined in the way we grow in the market. We strongly think that we have to be very, very cautious. And we strongly think that the growth has to come out from new markets that, like what we are doing in the bosses and not necessarily from cannibalizing our, 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 our uh, competitors. We need to actively participate in the New Mexico City Airport. The New Mexico City Airport is, is something, guys, I mean, it's something that we cannot afford not to construct it, okay? I mean, we're a country with 130 million inhabitants. By the end of year 2022, we'll probably going to be 130 million inhabitants, and we have probably the worst airport in Latin America, believe me, okay? One thing is what you see as a passenger when you get there, but one thing is operating in that airport, and that's a real nightmare. We really need the airport, we really, and we all as a community, airlines, manufacturers, um, IATA, everybody has to support the construction of this airport because it's something really important for Mexico. And this is far away, um, but we cannot allow a mistake in its function in design. That's the second part of it. It's very important that we design an airport that is really going to carry us in the next 50 years or in the next 30 years. And it's not just about doing a beautiful design. It's not just about challenging the lake which it, where it's going to be constructed. But on top of that, it's really an airport that we need that has to function in terms of connectivity, that has to function in terms of services. And that's really important. So we need to actively participate in that project in the following years. Well, we manage the actual airport in terms of slot constraints. And this is the second part. It's very difficult. I mean, we are already with a problem of a constraint at the airport of Mexico City. And we are at least six to seven years away from, from having a new airport. So it is very important, and it is absolutely of the essence that we all help the government, and we take a role, not being a blockstone in this process, but we take a role which is a positive role to support the government to manage the slots in the following year and try to reduce the constraints as much as we can. We will continue pushing, and here I want to say, I'm probably the only aviation guy in Mexico that's supporting the opening of the bilateral with the US, and I don't care to say it, 
I'm very happy and very proud to say it. I think Mexico has to compete at the level everybody competes in the world, and we need a U.S. bilateral, which is open, and I absolutely support it. And that's how we got to opening the bilateral, and we are in the discussions with the Senate for approval, so it gets in effect on January the 1st next year. The other thing that we have to do is we have to be watchful. Um, here, it's very important to say we have to be all, not only watchful, but politically correct in what the Senate is trying to do with the new consumer protection rules and what they want to approve for Mexico, because most likely, if they get approved for Mexico, they will be approved for the rest of Latin America. And regulators do not understand that we cannot continue hurting consumers in forms of higher costs for the airlines and those higher ticket prices. We really need to continue doing it, okay? And one thing which is really important, I think the push for the consumer protection rules that they are doing in Mexico is already going far away from the borderline and it's probably going to create something which is in terms of insecurity when we fly. Let me finish this afternoon telling you guys. I mean, I am an operator, and I was born at the ramp, and I worked at the ramp for many years. It takes me a lot to come to New York and speak to a community like this, because I consider myself an operator, and that's what I should be doing, and that's what I do right. But there are two things that I would like to leave at the table this afternoon. Aviation, for me, is equal to change, and change is the only constant in the airline business. And the second thing, I strongly think that the ultra-low-cost model is here to stay, and we are here to expand and improve it. Thank you very much. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Um, speaking on behalf of the donkeys in the room, I just want to say <laughs> that was a fantastic tour de force of the Mexican uh, travel industry and economy. So thank you very much, Enrique. Unfortunately, we've used up all the time. So if you want to have any questions for Enrique, I'm going to have to ask you to grab a hold of him after we finish the formal proceedings. Uh, but next up, we want to make the raffle drawing. Um, so Enrique has a bowl here. If you could put your hand in, pull out two cards. The first one we will uh, give the magnificent Airbus A320 model in Volaris colors, which goes to uh, Gioria Gentile from JetBlue. Now, of course, our really rather remarkable uh, prize drawing to have your name on the front of a real airplane. CRT Capital, Mike Durchin. <laughs> How appropriate is that? <laughs> Thank you very much. We're going to do a photo off here. Thank you. Maybe I should say, Mike, um, I mean, we'll send you first a render, I mean, so you like it, okay? Then we'll produce it, and then we would like you to come down to Mexico, Borari Space, your expenses, to fly in your own aircraft. Wow. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. I also want to present the usual Wings Club plaque to Enrique to mark his uh, speech here today, so bear with us for 30 seconds. Enrique, thank you. Thank you very much. much.